So last week I launched this channel, Digging the Talks, as a complimentary channel to my main one, Digging the Greats. I've already used clips from my conversation with Ken Lewis in a couple of other larger music history videos, and I've released our full conversation on the Digging the Greats podcast, as well as clips from our conversation here in video form on this channel. But I've heard from some of you, you want the full conversation in video form on this channel as well. So, all right, let's do it. My guest today is Ken Lewis. He's a mixer, producer, and multi-instrumentalist who's worked with just a ridiculous number of huge artists. Kanye, Eminem, J. Cole, Usher, Watch the Throne, Queen Latifah, Pusha T, Drake, Kid Cudi, Alicia Keys. You know the secret Wu-Tang album, the one where they only made one copy? Ken mixed that album. So he's one of the few people in the world that's ever heard it. There are a ton of great stories that he tells, so let's just get right into it. Here's my conversation with Ken Lewis. No. Uh, or the internet tells me rather uh, that you uh, were involved in this uh, in in the sample recreation process. Um, so, can you tell me a bit about how that went? How you got involved in uh, in that song, in that album, uh, and, and Kanye and Joe? Well, I, I've been working with Kanye since about two thousand and one or two thousand and two, uh, since long before he was an artist or anybody really knew he wanted to be an artist. Um, but uh, snap forward to uh, the college dropout. I think I worked on five or six songs on the college dropout. Uh, most of what I did was sample recreations um, and a little bit of songwriting and production. Um, on All Falls Down, he had this uh, Lauren Hill sample that had this nylon string guitar and uh, and I had, I had been, like you gotta understand, during the college dropout, the end of it, we were awake for about two weeks straight and I'm not slightly exaggerating. It was probably the worst thing I've ever done to my body. And, uh, <laughs> but so I, one night I just turned in uh, one big piece of work that uh, Kanye had me working on. And uh, he, it was like one o'clock in the morning there. He loved it. And then out of the blue, I get this call at like uh, 7 a.m. from Kanye. Dude, I got uh, Selena... Uh, Selena, Selena Johnson, Johnson yeah. yes. I got Selena Johnson in the studio right now. I need you to cut this guitar part and send it right back to me immediately. And I'm like, send it. So so he sent it. It was like <laughs> 7 in the morning, maybe 6 in the morning, 3, 3 o'clock in the morning by then in L.A. And I was in New York. And uh, so I grabbed, I just had an acoustic guitar. And I grabbed the acoustic and I listened to the part and I recreated the part, put it down. And, you know, fine-tuned it and sent it over. But I knew it wasn't right. It was. It really should have been a nylon string guitar, not a steel string. But when Kanye yeah. wants something, he wants it right fucking then, and there, you know, that's, that's that. Yeah. So, so after I turned that in at like nine o'clock in the morning, I drove straight to uh, Guitar Center and sat there in the parking lot till ten a.m. until they opened, and then I went straight back to the nylon string section and pulled every single one down off the wall played until i found a beautiful one that was really in tune and well intonated and i took that one back and i recut the part cleaned it all up and resent it and i sent it to plain pat wow. um who was the a and r on it and uh and uh pat calls me up and he's like no nah, dude you know we already mixed the song we we don't need this and i'm like pat you gotta recall the song and put these guitars in trust me on this he's like no nah, no nah, we're good and i'm like pat recall the song and put the guitars in dude so they did and he calls me later he's like bro you were so right oh those are so great oh thank you <laughs> so yeah um i mean that's the you know that's wow. the thing like i never know what I, I haven't worked with kanye since pablo but um uh yeah. speaking in the present tense uh you never know what kanye is going to throw at you and uh, yeah, yeah. So I ended up amassing a huge collection of instruments and sound libraries and everything, just so that whenever he would call, whatever the hell he needed, I could just get the work. Right. And uh, but yeah, awful. So you don't have to go wait in the in the guitar center <laughs> parking lot until they open. <laughs> exactly. So were you then in the nylon, like playing nylon strings in guitar center? I'm assuming because you're doing a sample recreation, you're playing the actual part uh, in guitar uh, center. Yeah, yeah. I mean. So like there, there was no salesman. That's around, crazy. You know? It was it was still hella early. Yeah, you know? but it was like still you know. Yeah. Shaking off the sleep, and I'm here. When all it all falls down, and I'm like, okay, this, this is the one. <laughs> so that's 
That's crazy. I can just imagine, like, if there's a Guitar Center employee within earshot that's hearing you play that, and then, you know, a couple months later, whenever right. the, the song comes out, they're like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Why do I know that? You know, speaking of that, I, the first time I was ever in the studio with Kanye, um, he was producing a Memphis Bleak song, and uh, and he called me up, and he's like, can I need you to come down to the studio and put down some guitars on this shit? I'm like, okay, I'll be there. So I went down and I started doing some music for him. And uh, he sat on the back couch with a couple of his boys all night. Didn't pay attention to the session at all. Memphis Bleak wasn't there. So he, nobody knew. Oh. And Kanye sat on the back couch with a couple of his boys. And Kanye rapped for two f hours straight and just like off the dome. And the I sat there having no idea that he had... Uh, interest in being an artist and I sat there listening to his lyrics and his flow and going holy f sh who is this guy like okay I knew he was yeah. a talented producer but and the the thing that stuck with me the most was lines that I heard that night one time years later when the college dropout came out I heard those some of those same lyrics again on songs that I hadn't worked on and I was like, oh, oh wow. sh he said that line two years ago in the Memphis Bleak session. Wow. Like, that's yeah. how connected his sh was early. You got to remember, like, yeah. when Kanye came out, nobody was checking for him. Nobody, everybody was like, ah, oh, you know, producer wants to be an artist. Blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, after, after that night, I was, like, utterly convinced. I was like, this guy's either going to sell 10 million or 10. Because he was so different yeah. than everybody else. There was nobody like yeah. him. And nobody yeah. wanted to champion him because of that. Nobody wants to take a chance on yeah. the, you know, the outsider. But, man, it's incredible. Uh, what other uh, Kanye albums, since we're, since we're on Kanye now, what other Kanye albums have you had? Well, I worked on uh, College Dropout, Last Call. Um, he had me do a bunch of work on graduation, but ended up not using it. Uh, 808s after that. 808s after that. I worked on that, a bunch yeah. of stuff on 808s, Heartless, and Robocop, and a couple others. Um, I worked on Gold Digger on uh, uh, Last Call. And then uh, would have been My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy after 808s. And God, I worked on. I produced the horn section on all of the lights. It's all live brass. Um, oh, all, I, all, oh, live, wow. all live brass, all done in my studio. Uh, and I produced and arranged sure. the whole thing with, um, my horn player was Danny Flam, who's, uh, from New York Brass, and brilliant, brilliant horn player. He brought, like, 25 horns to the session, I'm not joking, and he could play every single one of them. Wow. There, there was, like, he brought four different trombones, probably three different trumpets, a tuba, a sousaphone, another sousaphone, a bass trumpet, a flugelhorn, yeah. uh, and we just, you know... We just kind of went through about an eight-hour, maybe ten-hour session, and Kanye had uh, provided me a simple melody to follow along. Kanye calls me up, and he's like, dude, I want you to do uh, a horn section that sounds like, uh, you know, a stadium at halftime. And he said, mm -hmm. and all he did was he sent me this uh, little Casio uh, melody that sounded like a $20 keyboard. <laughs> and that was it. And then he calls and he's like, I want it to sound yeah. like a stadium at halftime with a marching band. Like, done. Yeah. So then I just went and did it and turned in the exact thing that you hear. And it was radio silence. Mm. Didn't hear a thing, which usually in Kanye land means... You know, he listened for like 30 seconds and it didn't catch him and he just yeah. shit all the work out. But like three months later, they call yeah. me for something else uh, and they're like, uh, you know, ask me to do something else. And I hadn't heard about the horns. I'm like, yo, the horns on Ghetto University, what happened to those? And he's like, oh, no, they're, they're great. We love them. They're perfect. They're, they're in. So I'm like, thank you. Because cause I've done a bunch of other horn sections that I thought were money that he hasn't used. Choirs. And, yeah. You know. It's, but when you do something like that uh, and it doesn't get used, are, are you paid only for the stuff that's used? Okay. And then if you're making, you know, a bunch no, of they, stuff. They, oh, yeah. they pay me for every gig that I do, um, whether they use it or not. Okay. And then uh, if they don't use it, 
you know, occasionally I might repurpose some of the, you know, like individual parts into my own productions and shit like that. And because I mean, there's like yeah. amazing horn sections and choirs and shit that just yeah. never got used for anything. So, you know. Yeah. And if you got it, you might as well use it. it. Yeah, you can flip that stuff. Nice. Okay. The Jesus Walks interlude on the Grammys. Yeah. That was like a, a very rapid turnaround. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Uh, Kanye calls me a week before the Grammys. I think this was 2005. And uh, he says, Ken, what are you doing today? And I'm like, whatever you want me to be doing today. And he's like, all right, come down to Sony. Bring your gear. Uh, I need you to do an interlude for, for my Grammy performance. And I'm like, all right, let's fucking go. So, so I went down to Sony Studio B, and I basically brought my whole studio with me. I think I used their speakers and their assistant, and that was about it. And set up my whole. Creative do you most of the time do do you most of the time do stuff remote uh, from your own usually, setup? Then, yeah, most of my work for everybody is almost always cool. remote, um, unless I'm producing. Okay, uh, but uh, yeah. so I'm in Sony Just Studio sure. B, set all my stuff up. Kanye is supposed to come in like early evening and hear what I'm cooking up. So I spend all afternoon cooking up this entire, it's a one minute orchestral arrangement that segues between Jesus walks and this gospel thing that he did live. And at the very end of the uh, orchestral section is a car crash as well. And so I created the whole orchestral section into the car crash. And then when you see it on the Grammys, uh, he kind of goes into silhouette and then uh, he switches into gospel after Jesus walks. It's epic. So he never came in. Um, he never heard it until, I guess, you know, at some point he listened and no changes. It went. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in the Grammys uh, in the audience because we were nominated for album of the year. And, uh, and I got to hear my interlude live on the spot um, being played on stage while I sat in the audience. It was pretty wild. And that was the same day? No, no, it was like a week later. So he, oh, yeah, week, okay, he calls week. me a week before the gotcha. Grammys. Everything was done that day. And then I didn't hear anything from him. And then I see the performance and all my work. Is and then you see it live and go, all right, I guess. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I used it. Great. <laughs> Seriously, like our business is a lot like that. There are so many times, and I'm sure most people yeah. would tell you, like a lot of times you just don't know until the album comes out or until right before, you know, sometimes if you're a producer or something like that, they, you got contracts and then you know you're on the record, but you know, even then, yeah. not always. So, you know, it's nice when you have that confirmation. Yeah. Okay, uh, last thing on Kanye, and then I wanna uh, move through some other stuff. Uh, tell me about your involvement with uh, Watch the Throne. Uh, Watch the Throne, I did, I worked on five songs on that, I think. I don't even remember all the uh, titles. Um, the thing that I had the most fun with was, so there's this interlude at the end of No Church in the Wild that sounds like a little polka orchestra. And I created that, and that's not a sample. That was, he sent me something, I can't remember who did it. Um, I think like most Def or somebody did it. And it was, it was all a sample, but I went totally away from that and just used that as inspiration and created that whole kind of polka orchestra that you hear. And uh, so, yeah. so that became my big hip hop claim to fame was that I got to play accordion on uh, Watch the Throne. <laughs> I don't think any, I don't think any other hip hop heads can claim that they played accordion on a classic track. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I, what a what a wild thing to be able to say. I love it. Nutty. Um, one of my other favorite things from Watch the Throne was. Uh, the very last day of recording. The album was closing seven o'clock that night. I get a call at, at noon and, uh, and it's Kanye's manager. And he's like, uh, Kanye wants you to arrange an eight bar horn section in the bridge of new day. Uh, and we need it delivered by 7 PM and it's noon and he wants a horn section. So I called, Danny Flam from New York Brass. Danny was in Israel, couldn't do yeah. it. Danny recommended four guys for me. And so I I burned uh, the um, song that I had to write to, to a CD multiple times. While I was driving into the city, I arranged the parts in my head, 
um, sketched them out when I got to the studio, put parts in front of all four players, taught them to them. We had, uh, we recorded from, I think, five to six. Six to seven, I cleaned up the arrangement, hopped in a cab, and took a thumb drive straight down to uh, the uh, um, Submercer down in Soho. So they had the, sub, the, um, the Mercer Hotel locked out. They had three rooms there doing the whole album. So I, they wouldn't do anything on over okay. the internet. It was all in person. So I literally had to bring a thumb drive to them. And uh, But by 7.15, I walked in, handed it, and they put it in. The album closed that night, and we f made it. And then we had a party at the Submercer that night for the closing of the album for everybody who worked on it, which was a lot. Well, let's talk about uh, what are you working on now, um, and then talk about mixing night, uh, talk about uh, I'll kind of turn it over to you to uh, talk about your online presence and stuff you're doing, um, and and we can, we nice. can talk about that. Uh, so right now I'm I'm building my Studio A. I just built Studio B and C, and uh, Studio A is going to be a big immersive control room, full nine one six Atmos and Sony three sixty, and uh, um, and I've been mixing a lot of Atmos lately, which I absolutely love. Right now I'm mixing the Donna Summer. Uh, catalog or uh, the singles anyway, and uh, mixing like you know, a bunch of Atlantic Records stuff and other things. Um, stereo. Last week I just had three songs, uh, not three songs. I had three albums in the top ten on the Billboard 200, uh, which is the second time that's happened to me in my career. Um, and last year I had three songs in the top Amazing. ten on the Billboard Hot 100, which is the only time that that's happened to me in my career. <laughs> so. It's been a pretty good run. Yeah. The I'm I'm man, things are hitting on all cylinders lately, and uh, I can't complain a bit. Uh, the work is finding me like crazy, which is great. And uh, my other passion right now That's is great. obscene stealers, which is uh, me and Michael Moss. My nickname for him is Michael Moss, the movie trailer boss, because Michael's day job is uh, composing movie trailers, and he's a beast. I mean, he's done. Like Tenet, Dune, Star Wars, Fast and Furious, Mulan, like all these f***ing heavies. And so he and I produced a song together a couple years ago, and we did a full full orchestra, the Sophia Session Orchestra, and 53 pieces. It was amazing. And after that, we just loved working with each other. And you know when you just find those creatives that you super, super click with? He was one of them. And, and yeah, when, we, yeah. when we finished, he said, you know, I want to keep working with you. Send me something to send me something to work. I'm like, all right. So I sent him a bunch of acapellas from like some of my favorite songs that I had written over the years that had just hadn't gotten placed and still great songs just needed yeah. a, you know, a different approach. So we took that. So scene stealers was started as redoing old versions of some of my favorite songs. Obscene stealers is very cinematic could be cinematic pop or hip hop or we go down all sorts of lanes and but we all the two of us we describe our music as epic af and it's there's something epic about it whether it's hip hop or edm or pop or whatever we just find great songs write great songs produce great songs and then as soon as we have one ready to go we put it out and start working on the next one and we're hoping we're really targeting uh, sync licensing with that mostly, film, TV, video games, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so I've done real well in sync uh, previously. So if I can get this one back into a sync lane, I'm going to be doing real good. Tell me about uh, mixing. So uh, mixing night, we started the first, sec actually second week of lockdown during the pandemic. Uh, you know, New York City was hit like a f tornado with COVID. And nobody knew what was going on. Everybody was freaking out. And my friend from Germany, Dom Ravinius, uh, was over visiting for a week. And he got stuck with us for three months. So we were all, you know, we had all this, like, audio and video gear and nothing to do. And we were like, why don't we just try, you know, live streaming and see how it goes. So we started Q&A with Ken. We did Q&A with Ken twice a week and then once a week and then... Uh, Q&A with Ken morphed into Mixing Night, uh, and we've been doing Mixing Night. Now we do it uh, the first Wednesday of every month. Mixing Night is like Howard Stern for studio folks. So it's not the classroom. It's not, I mean, it's educational in that you're definitely going to get gems from me every show. 
but I'm not hitting you over the head with them. Yeah. I'm just like, it's just like friends hanging out. And uh, it's the funnest show. Yeah. Uh, we absolutely love putting it on. Uh, we don't monetize it so that I can do exactly the show that I want with no filter, with no yeah. company controlling what I can show and say. And, and, you know, with me, I'm 30 years into a very successful career. I could show you every single thing that I do and you're going to go make great records that sound like you, not me. So why not share? So that, you know, mixing night was, it started as a way to keep everybody together in community during pandemic. And now it's morphed into this amazing community of creatives that we have worldwide that like when we have like beat challenges, so sometimes we'll get some, not sometimes, every time we get submissions all over the world. The influences are amazing. And it just, that's one thing that I think is that I've been really lucky with that I've done so much international work all of that international work is inspiration and experience for all of my other work and vice versa so yeah. I'm constantly getting all of these outside influences that a lot of other people aren't really getting in the same way which is creatively I love so. yeah um, what platform is uh, mixing that is on YouTube um, I think we're going to try broadcasting out okay. to, to everything, but right now we're on YouTube. It's youtube.com forward slash mixing night. And, uh, we're the first Wednesday of every month, set your alerts and, uh, it'll email you when we go live, but it's 8 PM Wednesday night, uh, for two hours, uh, first Wednesday of every month. And it's That's a throwdown. Cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a link in the description and everything. Yeah. So, uh, people can awesome. get right to it. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a lot of um, what is your background uh, musically? Did you, uh, did I, am I getting this right? You went to Berkeley? I went to Berkeley College of Music, yeah. Um, I, guitar is my main instrument, but I can, you know, music is all up here. Uh, and, and with, yeah. uh, you know, modern tech, I can create nearly anything. But I'm proficient in guitar and bass. I play a lot of bass. And, uh, and I can play keys enough to get all my ideas down. And uh, I played piano on a yeah. John Legend song, so um, I'm not too bad. Oh, on a John Legend song, uh, I saw you have uh, a John Legend credits uh, as well. What was the what was the song? Um, you another again. That was I. So I co-produced another again with uh, Kanye and John, and uh, I ended up um, playing just the underneath piano. John did all the really pretty solo stuff, um, and I just did the the comp yeah. chords on my baby grand, and uh, and he didn't redo them. I expected him to redo them, but he didn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about that. Uh, well, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, yeah an another uh, another wild credit. I, I, I have the strangest career. I just, I have kind of like, it's kind of like an octopus. Like, I do a whole lot of different things. Almost nobody that yeah. hires me for one thing has much of a clue of all of the other things that I do. And like, Kanye had no idea when he started hiring me for samples that I was a mix engineer. He had no idea. And because yeah. Manny American was mostly mixing for him and Manny was a friend, I didn't want to step on Manny's toes. I just didn't say anything. So one day I'm supposed to be working on the Blueprint 2 for Kanye and uh, uh, track one, Dream. Um, and uh, uh, Kanye produced that. It was the Jay-Z album. Uh, and, and, uh, oh, yeah. so, and I'm instead I'm at, uh, what was it, Legacy 509 was big, huge uh, orchestral recording room with Just Blaze. And we were recording an orchestra for Mariah Carey and then mixing it. And Kanye calls me right as we start the mix. And uh, you know, he keeps blowing up my beeper. This is beeper days. So <laughs> it's going way back. And uh, so I'm like, finally, I'm like, I got to <laughs> call him back. So I, I call him up and he hears the music. And he's like, where are you at? And I'm like, uh, I'm at uh, Legacy. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, we I just recorded uh, 22 strings for Mariah, and we're about to mix. And he's like, what do you mean you, you're about to mix? And I'm like, well, the strings are done, and now I'm going to mix the record. And he's like, why are you going to mix the record? And I'm like, I'm a mix engineer. <laughs> what? What have, uh, what have you mixed? So I start rattling off all these things I've mixed. He's like, Oh, well, I had no idea. Well, you just okay. We'll mix this too. So, so that's awesome. Yeah, it's, you know, um, professionally, I try and stay in whatever lane I'm supposed to be in. Like all of the knowledge comes yeah. with 
you know, all the knowledge and experience comes into every gig. But because I'm really good at yeah. a whole lot of other things, I don't want to step on other people's toes when they're the lead. I'm, I'm there to, you know, help them make their best records, not, you know, the record that I want to make. Yeah. Um, I do that when I produce. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of, uh, mixing stuff, um, another, uh, wild credit, uh, is you mixed, uh, once upon a time in Shaolin, the, the secret Wu-Tang album. Is this correct? Yeah. The secret double Wu-Tang album. Yes. Um, yes. So I looked this up and, uh, apparently the way it was, was recorded as well is, uh, certain people when they're rapping on a song that was not actually the final beat and it was like a different BPM or something. And then it was put together. And then I read that not even RZA has heard the final product. To my knowledge, um, they all have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There was, uh, there was some other, uh, interview and they had uh, broken it down and said that that was that way. But, um, what can you tell me about uh, the making or the mixing? Uh, anything about well, that, that album? So Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, I can talk about the mixing because that's really the only part that I know about. I don't know how the album was put together. The album was finished by the time it got to me. And uh, I get a call yeah. um, and uh, they ask me to sign an NDA. And I'm like, Kanye doesn't ask me to sign NDAs. I'm not signing one for you. So... <laughs> So they gave me the gig anyway, um, and I ended up uh, mixing the whole double album. It was like 30 tracks. Uh, I can tell you it was mm. like a hearkening back to their second album. Um, it felt like right in that lane, and it's chock full of samples, and, yeah. you know, skits, and, and all the old Shaolin movies, and shit. everything that you would want from a fucking Wu-Tang record, I, I feel like. You know, yeah. I feel like it's a great record, but I also completely and utterly understand the beef with um, a lot of the Wu Tang members that they're not happy with the way it went down. I got nothing to do with that, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, but yeah. uh, you know, but for me, like, I thought it was fascinating that they were trying to create an art piece, and the problem with art pieces is you don't get to choose who buys the art. <laughs> So obviously that shit stain of a a guy ended up buying the album and then not letting anybody hear it. And then it went into a government locker and now it's owned by Pleaser Dow, I think, Um, which is. uh, Yes, that's right. So I'm I'm praying that they release it. And uh, so who knows? Um, Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's been a few clips leaked, um, and but that's that's been it. Uh, other than yeah, that. the only stuff I've seen um, was the stuff that Screlly was playing, like on you know, just from his webcam. Yeah, he and did I'm a live stream. Like, can't hear that shit. You have one, also have a one writing more thing about the oh, uh, uh, one once upon a time in Shaolin. Uh, I had they told me yeah. that they had the idea of like taking it around for private listening sessions, and I was like you need to put it in a museum like MoMA museum of modern art in New York and have like headphone listening stations, make sure nobody can record it, but you know, let the fans hear this. I think the, I think Wu Tang would have had a different response to that album if their fans could have heard it. And you know, yes. In some sort of, yeah. So they didn't end up doing that. Uh, Which was a disappointment for me, but the album is great. I really hope the album comes out someday. So, and it's yes. every member of the Killer Bees, wow. every member of Wu Tang, including ODB, um, a bunch of guest appearances. Cher was on it. Um, it was pretty cool. So let me see. You have a, a writing credit on uh, Black of the Berry, uh, Kendrick. Uh, uh, how did that? Well, that about? should have been a additional production credit, or actually, it should have been a, a co-production credit. Uh, so we used to work a lot with Boy Wonder, and Boy Wonder was the lead uh, producer on that. He brought me and my partner Brent Colatalo in uh, to help him produce that song. Man, we put like 40, 50 hours into that thing. When Wonder turned in uh, his work and submitted us for producers, Top Dog refused to credit us as producers. So not only did they refuse to credit us as producers, they only gave us additional engineering credit which was not the role at all. Welcome to the music industry, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, because uh, we produced and created some of the music for it, you know, we got a writing credit as well. So at least I got 
something value out of it. Yeah. But what other stuff? Uh, Cause that just happens. So what other stuff uh, have you gone uncredited for that you uh, have worked on that you can at least, make? I mean, so many Kanye things, they early on, they were absolutely terrible at credits. They got way better later on. Um, uh, let's see the Shrek soundtrack. I didn't get any credit for, um, Oh, actually I did, but I didn't No, I didn't. Uh, and I couldn't get on the Grammys for that. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, it happens all the time, but, uh, you know, the, for young creatives out there who are working on projects, don't ever assume that other people are going to take care of your credit for you. And every time I would reach out to either the NR admin or the manager or both, anybody that I could who I knew was assembling credits, and I would make sure to directly give them my credits. And still, all the time, they're just not there. It's the music. You know, yeah. Nothing like, if you see Hollywood... Hollywood credits the groundskeeper and the assistant's assistant and every intern and, you know, the music industry is not like that at all. It's more like the wild west. Yeah. And I, I wish it was because uh, all music is like, you know, sometimes, they, although, you know, there's, there's missing stuff that you're mentioning already that it doesn't matter the service, they're not going to have it, but... Uh, title is better at listing credits in there if you um, look at the right, song. But they have to be in the song more. credits at first. And that's the that's the big problem. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, but yeah. But uh if you're vigilant about it, then you can usually get your credit. Yeah. So uh Uptown Special I you did worked it. on. I worked on Uptown Funk. So uh what what did you do on Uptown Funk? What was that process like? Because I mean you're talking about wide ranging career and that's like one of the biggest songs of the 20, 21st century. Yeah. yeah uh, that's wild. It, and, and, and everything actually that we've already mentioned are like some of the biggest albums of the 21st century. Uh, and this is a separate song, separate genre, wild. So uh, uh, tell me well, your experience. So Mark Ronson calls me out of the blue. I had never talked to Mark in my life. Uh, I knew who he was. Actually, I take that back. I met Mark Ronson when I was when he was 16 years old in New York and I was engineering on the Foreigner Mr. Moonlight album. And uh, he's the son of uh, the guitar player for Foreigner. So we were making that record in New York and, and 16 year old Mark Ronson swung through the studio and I remembered him later. I'm sure he didn't remember me. But but he calls me up and he's like, yeah. Ken, I got this song and uh, I'm really sorry that I need to underutilize your talents, uh, but I need some really simple stuff and you're the guy that keeps coming up for it. I'm like, okay. And apparently Bruno Mars had called him and uh, and recommended me to him. So, <laughs> Oh, yes, because you also worked on did, Unorthodox yeah. Jukebox. So, yeah. So Bruno called okay. Mark and Mark called me. And then I ended up working on Uptown Funk. Had no expectations, you know. I didn't. I didn't hear the full record at the time. I heard pieces of the record so I could do my jobs on it. And uh, and uh, my God, when that thing came out, it was just like, what is even happening right now? I mean, it. I think it broke the records for uh, most weeks at number one. And I mean, it's uh, yeah. if you look at my. There's uh, this app called Muso that uh, charts your streaming. So on, on Muso, this is utterly ridiculous. So my number one streamed <laughs> song is Uptown Funk with 6.7 billion streams. My number two is Gold Digger with 1.3 billion. So there's literally five and a half billion streams between Uptown Funk and massive, massive hits that I've worked on. Blue jeans, heartless. Yeah. Old Digger was also. It's, absolutely yeah, it's ridiculous. And uh, so, yeah, that was just a really lucky one to get on. And, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. uh, fortunate enough to have a lot of luck in my career. Um, but I, I tend to that's, be that's awesome. like, the weird thing is, I tend to get um, like I'm a designated hitter for a lot of heavies. So if they don't have time to do yeah. something or they know that I'm really good at something and they just need, they'll call me up and have me do, you know, the horn section on all the lights or a sample recreation or mix this or, 
you know, do a choir. But, uh, okay. So <laughs> keeps things very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much of your work is with uh, musicians or actual, um, you know, a, a physical instrument versus uh, software? Well, I'd say it's become more software over the years. Uh, but I mean, even yesterday I was playing yeah. guitar on something. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've played guitar on hundreds and hundreds of records. I've played multi instruments on hundreds of records. And, uh, uh, produced choirs, produced string sections, uh, horn sections, you know, you name it. Um, so yeah. I think, you know, when people try and pigeonhole you into one thing, like, oh, yeah, yeah you're a hip-hop producer, right? You're a, you're a rap, you know, guy. And like, no, I'm, I'm a producer. I make music. Point me to the music. If yeah. I connect with it, I'm in. Yeah. And, you know... And I, I think that's just one of one of those gifts is because Kanye kept pushing me down all of these different lanes that I had never gone down before. And I just had to figure out how to do all of this in real time and yeah. impress Kanye West at the same time. So, so that, that really builds your skill sets pretty fast. Right. And if you get 30 years of that piling up, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I can do a few things. Okay. So... Let's do uh, uh, just two more quick things. I'm thinking like a rapid fire. I'm going to, I'll list off uh, some other credits. And then if you have uh, something to say about it, um, we can, we can do that. And then um, I had put, I have a, a discord channel and I had put up, I didn't uh, list your name, but I said, uh, I'm interviewing you and here's some of your credits. Do we have any questions? Um, so uh, there's just if, a couple questions if. from those. Rapid fire. Uh, Alicia Keys, Girl on Fire. Uh, I did the big drum song, Girl on Fire. Alicia Keys is amazing. I love that girl. She is just one of the most genuine people to work with Fantastic. on planet Earth. Fantastic. Um, Pete Rock. Soul Survivor. Uh, yeah, I, I ended up engineering and recording the entire uh, Pete Rock Soul Survivor album, and I mixed one song on it featuring Heavy D and Coco T. No, that was a different song, but... Uh, but I did mix one song on Soul Survivor. And, yeah, I mean, Pete Rock. And back then, like, not everybody really knows nowadays who Pete Rock is, but back then, Pete Rock was a yeah. legend. And he hadn't been around in a while, yeah. and he was doing a new album. So I was like, oh, my God. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, that, yeah. that was a... I, I love Pete. Dollars. He was a, He was really great. See what um, <laughs> so... So I, I think the funniest moment of working on the Pete Rock album was with Ray Kwan. And uh, we were at Battery Studios and uh, we recorded a Ray Kwan song. And then the tech at Battery erased the first minute and a half of the entire song, including all of Ray Kwan's verse, and then put the tape back away and didn't tell anybody. And nobody ever admitted to it. So clearly, we left Battery and went down to Green Street, and Battery paid for us to be at Green Street. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm down at Green Street, and we're waiting for uh, Raekwon to show up. And I got everything set up and ready to go. Raekwon walks in, and he's like, I'm short, and he's up to here on him. And, you know, he's a street kid. I'm not trying to tangle with him, but it was a little amusing. He, he walks straight in, and he's like, yo, dude, you want to erase my sh Yo, that's straight violence, man. And I'm like, dude, do you think I would be standing here right now if I was the one that erased your shit? I'm here to fix it. He's like, all right, all right, I just had to check. All right, let's yeah. go, let's go. Oh my God. <laughs> another threat from another rapper. Great. <laughs> okay, uh, continuing on rapid fire. Uh, Mariah, uh, Carey. Mariah Carey. A uh, couple times I got to work on her stuff with Just Blaze. Uh, I've never met her. Um, I've only, she has her own engineer that records all of her vocals, but I've talked to her on the phone and I, I adore her. That girl is a boss. And, uh, um, we did, uh, uh, a song on charm bracelet and then we did a big remix on charm bracelet. And that was the one that I did the orchestra for when, uh, Connie called me and I was supposed to be working on the blueprint too. <laughs> I'm working on Mariah's. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the, the one thing that Mariah did that I was super impressed by 
we were at uh, the big room at Legacy. It was like 5000 a day just for the room. And then on top of that, me and Just Blaze. And we had the room locked out for five days, and we yeah. weren't doing anything. It was sitting empty, and I was sitting there waiting for Mariah. And Mariah was down in the Caribbean on vacation. And this was slow internet days. And uh, so we had to upload yeah. an MP3 to her. She'd download it, listen, and then uh, she'd call us and give us notes whenever she listened, which could be the next day or the day after. So one day she calls and her manager had, had told me to let the room go, like until she came back. So I'm on the phone with her and we're talking about the thing and I get all the changes that she wants and we, we do all that. And I'm like, so uh, your manager wants me to, uh, you know, cancel the room until you get back. She's like, no, hold it. I'm like, um, okay, but I said, hold it. Okay. No problem. You got it. We're in. <laughs> and that's it. I 150,000% respected that so much. She was so, so cordial yeah. right up until the moment that it was like, oh, she's the boss, not the manager. She's the yeah, one that makes, and she made the decision. And then she snapped right back into being the most cordial, amazing person ever. It was such, and you know, I got to respect the hell out of that, man. Like, people who know how to take charge when, yeah. when she's getting slightly off her else for him. That was impressive. Uh, Queen Latifah. <sighs> Love that girl. Um, I only got to work with her maybe 95 or 96. It was on the uh, soundtrack for something about the money. Um, I can't remember what it was. But uh, uh, so <laughs> it was the only time I've ever worked with Latifah. I wish I could work with her every day. So I was at Soundtrack Studio B in New York City and uh, just by myself, the assistant wasn't even in and, and Latifah walks in uh, by herself and she looks over at me and she immediately cracks on me. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so I crack back on her, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, I play her the song and, and I had recorded all of the song up to that point and then it was time to record her on it. And, uh, so she's in the booth and it's just me and her and uh and I can see her through the glass clearly and she's in this big like uh athletic jersey type shirt and she's sweating her ass off. It's hot in there. And she's like she's like, Man, I'm dying in here. And, I'm, and I just I go on the talk back, I'm like, I always travel with a t shirt. You're welcome to borrow it if you want. And she's like, Word? Yep. So I had this Ampex 499 t-shirt, just black, and it fit me fine, and I'm not a big guy. So she took that t-shirt, and she put that thing on, and it was so tight, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, it was a, you know, orange. And, uh, and she must have worn that for like three hours during the session. She had friends coming in and out, and it was the most hilarious thing to see. But I love that, like, you know, I love when stars that big can be so down to earth. And like Jay Z is one of those guys. Queen yeah. Latifah is one of those uh, people, and it was just an amazing. It felt like I had worked with her a hundred times before, and it was the only time I ever got to work with her. And she's a brilliant singer. Yeah. That's so. Awesome. You know, yeah. That that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, it just it depends on uh, how much uh, how much time you have and how long it. you want to go. There's so many credits. Um. Uh, uh. Yeah, you work with Jay Cole, oh, yeah. yes? Uh, Born Center. Yeah. That was another crazy one. Uh, Jay called me out of the blue at like 6 o'clock on a Saturday night, and I'm sitting in my studio alone, and he's like, uh, is this Ken Lewis? And I'm like, yep, this is Jay Cole. Hey, Jay Cole. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, um, so we started getting talking, and he starts telling me about this new album that he's working on. And, uh, and it's still early stages, but um, Drake recommended... Uh, me to J. Cole because I did the choirs on Lord Knows on the Take Care album uh, for Just Blaze. Right, because yeah. you talk about so, that. <laughs> Lord Knows choirs and all the, the kind of the music under the choir, that's all me uh, and my people. Um, but uh, so, so Drake uh, told J. Cole, J. Cole calls me. I could, I could tell, I could hear like the, him typing as he was talking to me. And clearly he hadn't Googled me before he called. And he's like, I was like, did you? Yeah. He says, uh, one point he's like, did you work with Kanye? 
I'm like, yeah, I've done a ton of stuff. You're like, you did last call? You worked on All Falls Down? You, you worked on? And I was like, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, what are you doing tonight? I'm like, what do you want me to be doing? <laughs> so, so Jay Cold yeah. came over by himself. <laughs> he doesn't, he lived maybe an hour away. Uh, he drove over by himself, um, got there at like 11 o'clock Saturday night, stayed until like two or three in the morning, played me most of the album in progress. And we just, he'd play me a song and he'd be like, what are you hearing? You know? And, and it was all like, he wanted, mm -hmm. so to back up, he wanted me to produce live strings and live choirs for uh, Born Center. So, you know, he would play me a song and he'd be like, all right, you know, you hearing anything? What are you hearing? And we would just talk through a whole bunch of things. And then that ended up leading to, uh, I produced the choirs and uh, strings on Crooked Smile, on, I think, five on Born Center. We did a bunch of skits uh, on the record, just live on the spot during the choir session. That wasn't supposed to happen. It just kind of did. One of the most impressive things I thought about Jay Cole was the choir session. Like, it was like 30 choir members, and he took pictures with everybody, signed autographs, was super cordial, personally mm -hmm. thanked everybody. It was like real first-class human. I was super, super impressed. And uh, uh, But the crazy thing about that album is back to the Muso app. Um, the thing that I would have never predicted in my entire life would have been that she knows is now the number 11 song I have ever worked on in my career. And that was an album cut on that album. That was, and I produced yeah. the strings on that album. It was live string section, 16 strings. And now it's at 716 million streams. How? And it's TikTok. So it became viral on TikTok for She Knows. Uh, and then that, um, re 10 years later, re-blew the song up, or eight years later. So... Yeah. Man, the internet is a powerful beast. So, um, yeah, yeah that's, that's wow. Yeah, that was awesome. crazy. Yeah. And then the other thing about Born Center was I had also worked on Yeezus. Yeezus and Born Center came out the same day. Yeezus was number one. Born Center was number two. Hmm. The next week, Yeezus number one. Born Center number two. Week three, Born Center number one. Yeezus number two. So. That was, uh, I couldn't believe it. I could believe it. For you're, you're just, oh man, it was, no. it was amazing. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, you worked on, uh, the album Throwback, confessions. Yeah. Um, I'll throw yeah, yeah. Anything come to mind for that? I love Usher. Uh, that was the only time I, that was the only time I worked with him in person. First time I worked for Usher was his very first album when he was 16 years old and Puffy was producing. And I engineered a lot of the um, sessions for Puffy, uh, but none of the vocal recording sessions with Usher. And uh, snap to the Confessions album and Just Blaze gives me a call. He's like, I'm doing a song with Usher, I need you. I'm like, okay. So I, I came down, I was mixing everything that Justin, uh, Just Blaze did at that time. So I came down to the studio and we ended up mixing the record and he wanted, um, he had a uh, e-bass try and put guitar down on it and e-bass couldn't nail the sound that, that Justin was looking for. And I, I gave it one listen. I'm like, bro, I can do that in five minutes. He's like, no, you can't. e-bass has been trying all day. I'm like, bro, you know me. So he goes, all right. <laughs> so, so I sent my, uh, assistant, uh, back to my own studio. We were at baseline. I sent my assistant back to get some gear. I got my Les Paul and a couple of my pedals and uh some other gear and i plugged it in and learned the part and played the part and and nailed it and brought him in and uh, he was like no no f way <laughs> <laughs> so the crazy thing about uh throwback was um cardiac redid the beat uh, that throwback beat and put a different spin on it for Chloe and Chris Brown, which just came out like three months ago, a song called, how does it feel? So I played guitar on that too. So <laughs> I'm racking them up, but, um, yeah. yeah, mixing for Usher was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and recording him when I, I recorded the, the lead vocal on throwback and, uh, it was the only time I've gotten to record him in it. He was such a, a seasoned professional we instantly clicked. It felt like we had been working together for 10 years and it, he was a little bit flat, you know, I could, had no problem being like, 
you know, one more time. And he was, he instantly trusted me. I think he just figured like, okay, just blaze put you in the room. You must know what you're doing. Five minutes into recording, he, he understood yeah. that I understood. And it just, it was just, yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. He's working together. That's great. Let's go rapid, rapid fire. So I got Kid Cudi, Diana Ross, George Benson, Public Enemy, Eminem. And so Paul. Diana Ross, we broke the record for keeping her in the studio the latest. We were working up at the Carriage House, and she had done all of her records at the Carriage House. I was with a producer named Malik Pendleton. And uh, and we went in. Malik produced and wrote the songs. We went in, and, and Diana comes in about 9, and the owner of the studio says... She's never been in the studio past 1 a.m. She'll probably want to go home by 11. Like, okay. So come 1 a.m., the, the studio owner sitting in the chair in the studio stewing at us because we're still working, and he's her ride home. We ended up working until 3.45 yeah. in the morning. Yes. Totally. She was She was having a ball. She didn't want to leave. So, um, and then uh, the, the next... Day, I come in for a follow up session and nearly got in a fist fight with the owner of Carriage House uh, because he was because we kept them there so long. I'm like, boo hoo, you little f- <laughs> Jesus, people in this biz, man. So, um, let's see, the other one was uh, um, run that list down. There was another really juicy one in there. Yeah, George Benson, Public Enemy, Eminem, and Yeah, pu- Public Enemy, I got called to mix one song on He Got Game, and I ended up mixing five on the album. Um, and I mixed, hmm. I got called at like 11 o'clock at night to Hit Factory, threw all my gear, and I was there an hour later. And uh, so I mixed the first song. I only got called for one song, and the, the A&R and the, um, comes in and hears the song, and he's like, can you stay and mix another one? Yeah. After song two, can you stay and mix another one? We have to move rooms. Okay. They put me up in Studio E for uh, mix four and five, and I mixed the last two songs on the record. I think my best mix on the record was Resurrection, and that was the last mix that I did. And that was the first time that I had... That was the longest I've ever stayed awake in a row in my life. That was 67 hours without sleep. And then I slept... I got a hotel room right down the road for six hours at the seediest... And but it was all, all I could get, and then woke up six hours later and went to my Aretha Franklin session, and did eighteen hours on a remix for Aretha Franklin, and then went home and slept for two days. <laughs> but but at the time, you know, I, I think I was like twenty eight, maybe twenty nine, and at the time, it yeah. was the most amount of money that I had ever made in my entire life in such a short period of time. And it was also Public Enemy and Aretha Franklin. So it was like that the adrenaline of those two things was everything keeping me awake. And if it had been lesser artists, I wouldn't have stayed. Yeah. I mean, to work with Public Enemy in the 90s was that was it. Two questions. These are from uh, from Discord. One is what which artist has been the most fun to work with and why? And then. If you feel comfortable answering, uh, which has been the most difficult? Uh, uh, most fun, I would say David Byrne. Um, for those who don't know David Byrne, he's the head talking head. He's the burning burning down the house guy, whatever was guy. And uh, so I ended up recording and mixing and playing on uh, the Look Into the Eyeball album, I think in 1998 uh, for David Byrne. And we did the entire thing at the cutting room on day one. Uh, I have everything set up, you know, the night before, full band, five pieces in David, well, four pieces in David. And we spend all morning, like, dialing in sounds, and then it's about lunchtime, and everybody comes into the control room, and David grabs the menu book, and uh, and he flips through, and he finds something he wants, and he grabs a pad, and he writes his order down. Then he hands the menu book to the bass player, takes the bass player's order. Guitar player, guitar player's order, and then me. And before before I even knew David Byrne, he's taking my lunch order for me, and that that pretty much set the tone for like how that album went. He's he was the most down to earth, the most musical, the most quirky. He rode his ten speed bike through Manhattan to the yeah. sessions every day, 
I mean, it was just, he's just a unique soul. It was so much fun. And I got to play on a couple album, uh, a couple songs on that. And, uh, yeah, what a fun project. Um, the most difficult? That's who, awesome. I, I mean, you know, Kanye's difficult, but I, it, but it, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't, I don't think of him when I think of difficult. I just think of him, like, challenging. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. But some of the most challenging uh, things that I've ever been tasked with have been from Kanye, for sure. Um, can't think of anything yeah. offhand, but I, you know, I, I tend to avoid um, working with people that I don't click with. So, you know, I may have had a session here, you know, a one-off with people that I didn't. That's going to happen all the time, you know. In this business, you you find your people, and you know, you you tend to do a lot of work with a lot of the same people. So I'm lucky. Okay, and then last one. Uh, do you have any tips for working through creative roadblocks? Uh, and do you have any stories of this throughout your career? Yeah. Um, one of the easiest ones for creatives is stand up, walk out of the room, go get some fresh air for 10 or 15 minutes, literally walk around the block, don't open your phone, just let some fresh air and nature in for a while, and then go back and just that that kind of quick reset can really open up avenues that you just were kind of walled off from before. Like one of the times where this happened the most, I was yeah. producing this uh, group called uh, Swim, and uh, the lead singer just couldn't get this part. He just it wasn't like I knew I knew his capabilities, and he just wasn't delivering. So I just told him like Joe. Let's take a walk around Manhattan for So we just took a half hour walk around Manhattan and we came back and he gave me one of the best performances of his entire life and mine. Uh, it was exceptional. And it was just that clearing moment of yep. like, I'm too in my head right now. I'm too like, this isn't fun. <sighs> Let me try again. No, you don't want to try again. You want to reset. You know, you can. So. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Like, uh, hearing from you your interactions i mean you obviously have done a lot of different things uh from production to instruments uh to mixing but uh, specifically what you're talking about with being the mixing engineer as like kind of hitting the ball back to with the with the um the performer or whoever's you know trying to get the take and then you're using your ears to get the best out of them and and I mean, it's obviously so much more than just working the controls. Like there's a psychological well, aspect to it. I think, I think uh, one of my secret weapons is that I have so many different experiences doing so many different roles that whatever role I'm called to do, if I'm called to mix, well, I'm going to just be the mixer. I'm not going to reproduce the song, but I'm taking all of my production knowledge, my artist knowledge, my recording knowledge, my arranging knowledge, my musical everything and i'm listening to that song from all of these different perspectives as a mixer and asking myself yeah. okay what's the best representation of the song where do i want to take it and it you know it's just um i think i don't know if i'm unique in that but i think that's a superpower that has served me super well over the years and i, I haven't did. thought about some we of did. these records in the um, longest time so it's it's really been fun to kind of, you know, kick the brain into gear and, and go over some of these memories. It's, it's been, yeah. thanks for the invite. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, thank you so much. I, I appreciate your time uh, and your stories. Thanks, Brian. Thank I you so much. I appreciate the invite, man. All right. And keep in touch. Yeah.